Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to move on. We will have time for questions at the end of this uh, presentation, so please pay attention for Jose Lopez Martinez. Thanks, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thanks for thanks everyone for coming. I'm Jose, but everybody calls me Pepe. And I'm here today to talk about uh, heap overflows, more specifically about a heap overflow vulnerability in one of the most important uh, uh, libraries in Linux system, glibc. It was discovered uh, this year, in January, by Qualys. They did such an amazing job. They could escalate privileges in by just changing the program name of any program name because it's a vulnerability in a glibc. So we're going to get to it. But first, let me introduce myself. I'm Jose. Everybody calls me Pepe again. <laughs> I'm, I work in offensive security as a pen tester, and I'm uh, pretty interested in, in reverse engineering exploit development. So this is a most accurate picture for me. <laughs> so, so, okay. Let's go into the, this talk. So, so um, we're going to start uh, talking a little bit about some basic concepts. Uh, what's a heap? Uh, how does it work? And then we're going to go straight to the heap overflows and this uh, specifically, this is specific vulnerability we're going to be talking about. At the end, I'm going to show you some POCs and some conclusions. Okay, so basic concepts. Let's go into Linux 101, Operating Systems 101. <laughs> What's the heap? I guess most of you guys know what is the heap, of course, but I wanted to explain <laughs> for everyone. So the heap is basically a memory region, so you can store information in, inside of it. And I always uh, uh, explain it with the stack because it's quite similar, but it's extremely different. <laughs> so the, the, the heap is uh, used for storing information uh, not associated to one specific function. So you want to store information inside the heap uh, for longer time. This is global, uh, global data, global attributes uh, ob in object-oriented programming. And in the stack, you want, in, you want to store information about one specific function call, like the return instruction, the return pointer of this, of the, of this, of this call, or all the information that is declared inside a function. So that whenever, when this function ends, all that information is gone. That's the reason the heap is to stay longer. The heap information is going to stay longer. Okay, and I always use this example because it's quite similar. The parking is extremely similar to, a parking lot is similar to the heap because you are going to see there are some cars, there are some spaces, and you can go driving with your car and and say, okay, I want to park here, there's a space here. Or maybe you want to park in some other places, but it's taken, so you cannot, of course, it would be weird, but. <laughs> so the, the, the normal state should be something like this, and you can see some gaps, so you, you can see some spaces in the heap. That's okay, that's normal. So it's kind of a little bit like chaotic, because there's no, there's no order like in the stack where it's a life of you, where you, you have last in first out. Here is random access. But it's not exactly chaotic. There has some order behind. Uh, this is a basic example. You, for example, you, you mallocate, you reserve uh, a space in, in the heap, uh, a chunk, those are called chunks. Uh, of A, for example. Then you reserve another chunk for B, this is another size. Okay, now you free the information from A. That the space is added to the, to the free list, so later you can use it. But imagine, for example, now you want to allocate another space, which is another block which is bigger. It's not the, the, the corresponding size, so it cannot fit on the, on the first place. Now it goes next to, to, the, to, the, to, to B. Uh, so the order is not exactly temporal, as you can see. Now another block comes in, and D is placed before the B and C. So this is this is what I mean. There's no such things as order. So you cannot go to to the heap and say, okay, this is the status. That that would be chaos. 
because you are going to see some spaces uh, everywhere and you're not going to understand what's going on. You have to understand the whole concept, the, the whole status, the, the, what, the, what has happened into the program so you can understand it, the status of the heap. And let's zoom in into the chunks. What's inside the chunk? A chunk, it's divided into two pieces, the heap metadata and the heap data. In, uh, because the heap uh, works like a, like, a, like, a, like a list, like a link list, let's say that way. Uh, the heap manager is the responsible to check uh, the, the status, the whole status of the heap. So it needs to go to the heap uh, metadata to see uh, what's going on inside the heap. It goes uh, to this information, the previous chunk, the chunk size, so we can understand what's going on, basically. And then you have the data. That's the place where you store your information. OK. So what are heap overflows? Like any other buffer overflow, it's a situation when you start writing more information that you are expected to, to be writing. So you reserve one space for D, but then you start writing more information that's going to overwrite all the chunks, and even the space between the heap. Uh, this is an, exa an extreme exa uh, simple example. Uh, you have one malloc of 10 bytes, and then you write more information, more than 10 bytes. That's going to make some errors. Of course, malloc invalid size, double free, free invalid size. All those errors might be different. Why? Why is that? Well, because the errors are not triggered, are not, are not raised uh, due to the overwriting operation. They are raised because uh, as a side effect of the writing operation. In those cases, you are writing the metadata of all the chunks. When the heap manager or when the program continues and tries to malloc information into the heap, and then the heap manager realizes there's something wrong on the heap because you have overwritten it, the, that, that's when the, those errors happen. So that's important. The errors are not triggered as soon as you overwrite the information. This is also the same for stack, buff, stack code based buffer overflows. So in a heap overflow exploitation, you, need, you, you have two different approaches. A metadata approach, it's a little bit more complex. You have some examples here from Phantasma, Phantasma Goria. Uh, we try to go into directly changing uh, specific parts into, in, inside the metadata of, the, of each chunk to maybe uh, take advantage of the heap algorithm itself. Uh, for example, if I remember, House of, Lord, the House of Force uh, tried to change the uh, size of a chunk in order to make a, a leak of information somewhere. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about the data approach. So we want to uh, override the data chunks, the, 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 the data part. So imagine we have a vulnerable buffer where we can override and start writing more information from that point, and we have a target buffer. As soon as we start overwriting, uh, the, we're going to be able to overwrite the information in other parts of the program. So that's too idealistic, let's say. Uh, what happens if the vulnerable buffer is not uh, before the target buffer? That's not, going, uh, that's, not a, uh, that's not a valid situation because we're not going to be able to overwrite the information of our, tower, of our, of our target buffer. So, what can we do in those cases? Okay. We have some techniques called uh, hip shaping. The hip, shapings, uh, the hip shaping techniques are those techniques used to uh, alter or change the hip layout so you can uh, obtain one a specific uh, valid layout that can help you to uh, overwrite all the information, whatever. So in this example, I use Feng Shui. Uh, Feng Shui is a technique to, to shape the heap. So you can change some specific variables you know that are going to be placed into the heap and you can change the sizes of each uh, variable. In this case, I, 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 I said here we have environment variables. That's, we're going to use. And if you change the size 
uh, of the value inside those uh, environment variables, uh, they're going to take more space. So that's going to change the heap layout. I says, as I said before, this cause and order. So you want to change, you want to play a little bit with all those things in order to obtain a, a valid heap layout. And now we are ready to, uh, to see the exploitation. So what is it? Well, it was, uh, as I said at the beginning, it was discovered by Qualys. They did an amaz amazing job again. And yeah, it's a uh, heap-based uh, buffer overflow. It was discovered, it was discovered at, the, the, uh, at the beginning of this year. And it was made uh, by some programmers, as always, uh, but they, trying to, they were trying to solve uh, a vulnerability, and they made a new one even worse. <laughs> so they published uh, a paper, which is really good. I recommend you to read it. And they included a lot of information. Uh, they also included a proof of concept. But of course, this is not the exploitation. This, the, this is just to check if your system is, has the vulnerability or not. This is just an exact command to uh, run sub-binary with, uh, with a lot of one characters and redirect the standard input to that null. Uh, if you have the segmentation fault, that's the vulnerability. Perfect. Okay, I have some. I, I have summarized this this information, this uh, report, into five uh, points. The first thing is that the vulnerability is in the VC's log internal function inside GLBC. Uh, this is the function that it's being used by the operating system to log information about what's going on. Uh, for example, you try to input a wrong, wrong username password, that information is going to be uh, written into the syslog. Fair enough. Uh, the binary chosen, uh, it's su binary, which has su ID bit. We're going to need it for the uh, privilege escalation, of course. Uh, the, the input uh, of, the of the heap overflow is the uh, argument back to zero, which is the program name. So we're going to play with it to make the, this heap overflow. Uh, they also said that you can uh, play, uh, you can make some feng shui uh, with uh, local environment variables, but uh, it's not that useful. We're going to see that they, they also said that it's better to use or, uh, the argument minus w from the sub binary. This argument is the wildlist option. When you use this wildlist, it, you define a, a list of environment variables that are going to be used by the next uh, cell. And uh, for the exploitation, uh, you are going to, we're going to use the pseudo baron same edit uh, technique. Um, uh, we're going to try to overwrite information inside, inside the module, inside the, the module uh, 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 class or attribute, I think, uh, from the subbinary. Okay, so this is the flow, the, the, the program flow. Hope you can see it. Not, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. The first part, as I said, uh, tries to uh, load the, the minus, minus W option from the SU. When you run SU minus W with some arguments, uh, it's going to check if they exist, if they're not, and it's going to perform some malloc and free operation. That's what we're going to use for the Feng Shui. Then, uh, when it's done, it asks for the password. It doesn't matter if you well, you have to uh, input a wrong password. And then uh, it's going to check uh, this function, uh, NSS lookup function, and then module load. The module load is one function inside subbinary that uh, it's used to uh, load some shared libraries that are by default inside one, one folder from nsswitch.conf. And you don't really need to play with it because they are, they are protected. You need uh, elevated privileges to change that. So uh, unless you have the possibility, like we are going to see, uh, to change that, uh, you're not going to be able to do anything with it. But here, uh, we're going to see what we can do. OK. So let's go. Uh, I, I use UDP PIDA with PIDA heap. I'm so old-fashioned, I know. 
and I set a wrapper in order to change the program name. Here's the wrapper I use. Uh, I define the buffer length, and then you can set the wrapper into the GDB and run it wherever you want. And I, I set the environment variables, you can set them, and then I set some breakpoints in the most important functions, which are VCC log internal function, uh, the environment whitelist uh, from string, and uh, SSLOOKUP lookup function, and module load. Okay. So here we are, the GDB in the, in the, in the VCC log internal function. Here you can see uh, the authentication failure error. This is what I, what I meant before. When you enter a wrong password, uh, this is what you get. The, that's the information that it's going to be printed inside the, the, the journal CTL. Journal uh, CTL, yeah. So this is the information uh, that it's going to be printed. And uh, this merge also the information from, from the program name. If you go to journal CTL, you're going to, we're going to see that later that uh, the, the, the message is going to say uh, su or sudo or any binary, uh, and the name of the program, and then authentication failure or any message it wants to say. Uh, this is the module. This is our, ta our target buffer. We want to specifically overwrite the name, in the name field inside the module. And yeah, uh, let's start with the faster. Uh, I perform some faster. I, I develop some faster strategies. This is the first one. This is not the a very good one actually. This is probably the worst. <laughs> I, I I did it with Python, of course, and I define all those uh, variables I wanted to fast. At the beginning, I was only fasting. Uh, sizes, different sizes. I defined a couple environment variables, one that existed, another one that did not, and then I tried with different combinations of, uh, you know, uh, different combination of amount of characters inside the program name, and yeah. I also use uh, some, something to, to store the crashes, the, whenever the program crashes, and I then check if, if, the, if this crash was unique or not. Yeah, just like any other uh, faster, faster. Okay, so at the end, my my the best faster I get, I, I guess, I define a longer list of environment variables. I define some brand, some random values, but it wasn't that necessary. I then change the the, the amount of times. I, I I play a little bit more. I realize also that you have to use uh, environment variable language. It is quite important, otherwise you, you're not going to be able to go anywhere. You have to define it with a valid, valid language. And yeah, I changed something here. Let me see if it's here. I also used uh, some uh, file descriptors. And this, is, this was also quite important because at the, at the beginning I was trying so many times with, uh, without file descriptors, redirecting the, the standard input from dev null. That's what they said, uh, quality said in the, in the report, but that wasn't helping. It wasn't, that wasn't working at all. So I tried different strategy and I tried to use enter basically. And I checked that I could go farther in the, in the exploitation with just entering any value. So that's the reason I use file descriptors to send the input and then we read what, what was happening. And those are the errors. You can see a lot of malloc, password, malloc, invalid size, segmentation fault. That makes sense. And eventually I read these two errors. And here I was so happy because I yes, said, finally, I, I was able to overwrite the module. This is the module that is overwritten. That's our target buffer. That's good. The, with, with 41 uh, characters. Uh, and then I tried to increase the amount of characters. I, I said, OK, yeah, this is the, the I, I was able to do it with, I don't remember. I think it was 9,000, uh, a program name of 9,000 characters. And this was the 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 amount of environment variables, say, comma, dot, to 1,500. So I moved uh, and, and executed with a little bit more of uh, characters into the program name. And then a new error happened, the, the, the second one, the, the one below. Uh, here I was overwriting the NI structure. 
I didn't know what was it, but I was overwriting it. I, don't, I didn't know why, but it was happening. So I tried to look a little bit closer and research what was happening, and I realized this, is the, this was the situation. Uh, my buffer overflow was happening uh, at the beginning. Uh, if I keep writing, I over, eventually I will, over, I will overwrite module pointer, that's the first error, but if I keep writing, I will overwrite the NI structure. The problem was that my, my target, the, the module data, was uh, after the NI structure, and the program was breaking, so I had two different possibilities. I could keep trying different uh, fuzzing, so eventually I, I guess I would find something good with uh, something uh, without uh, those things in the middle. But at the end, I tried to think a little bit and understand what was happening and, and why. Again, the heap is chaotic, but you can understand what is happening. With the Feng Shui, I realized when, we, when I started overwriting, and you, I know you won't be able to see anything, but don't worry. So I started overwriting a lot of A characters because I, that's what I define in the whitelist option. So for its, character, for its environment variable, it uh, malloc one uh, chunk of 20 bytes, the minimum size. But that, there was a pattern be behind it. Uh, I checked that between uh, two chunks, there was a space which was getting bigger. Uh, at the beginning, it was 40 bytes. Uh, the later, it was 50, 60, 70. And that's something normal when you play with the heap. And when I, I haven't talked about beans, fast beans, whatever. Uh, I don't mind all those terms. But in this case, I realized there were some uh, gaps, some gaps with a pattern. And what was happening is it was that those gaps uh, uh, are the places where the module pointer and the energy structure uh, were, were placed. Uh, this is what was happening, the buffer overflow at the beginning, the environment variables, and between those gaps, module pointer and NI structure. Okay, so I thought maybe I could define more environment variables with the size of those blocks. So if I define another environment variable called B with, uh, I think it was 60 bytes, the space module pointer was taken, and another one for the environment variable C, I could take those places because remember the, the environment variables are located into the heap at the very beginning. So the, when the program continues and assign the module pointer and the nice structure, it wouldn't be able to assign to those places. It will need the heap manager will need to place uh, other other uh, in other place. So I thought maybe that 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 might be. So yeah, I try. This is the space where it's located the module pointer uh, between uh, those 20 byte chunks. And then I define an F environment variable, and suddenly the, those, the, that gap was taken. So I thought, okay, that's good. Let me see if that works. I continued execution, and I realized the pointer was placed uh, uh, after the, the, the data. That was good because now I, now I was able to repeat the same approach with the NI structure. I had to define another another gap because there was another gap in the middle that was breaking things, and I eventually I was able to reach the name uh, field inside the, the 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 program name. So now we're ready for the library injection. Now we we have been able to overwrite the the the, the name. So what can we do? Same uh, pseudo baron, same edit technique. Uh, this was a vulnerability discovered in 2021, and they were able to use a heap overflow. Uh, Qualis as well uh, was able to uh, make this to exploit this vulnerability, uh, overwriting the module the module structure, more specifically, specifically the name field, and here. Uh, in the module load, there, there's a function inside the, this, uh, this structure, module load, 
and if uh, it says basically that if you have uh, one uh, uh, name that it's not predefined in the, into the things that are supposed to be there, it's going to load it, basically, <laughs> which is uh, pretty neat because that's what we needed. So uh, it, it, that's what we want to do. Okay. So now the problem is that you need to use one name with a slash, with an slash. So here they say a slash b a slash c. Uh, when the name it reads the module load, it's going to accomplish this requirement and then that's going to be loaded uh, into the program and executed. So the problem was that the, our heap of the flow uh, is the program name. That's the input we have. So we cannot uh, include the slashes into the, the, the program name. What can we do? Okay. Uh, at the end of the heap overflow, do you remember at the beginning I said, this is the business log function. It merges the, the program name with the error, with the error, in this case, authentication failure, uh, log name, UID 1000, UID, TTY, slash, dev, slash, PTS, slash one. So we have the requirement and yeah, that's how we were able to accomplish the, this requirement and here we have the, the lib nss uh, underscore a, my program name, uh, with the error all together and at the end you can see uh, root uh, so2, that's the shared library that it's going to be loaded. So with all of this information, I prepare a bash script uh, to take the, automatically the UID, the TTY, because upon different executions, you might have different things. So, and create the, the folder structure, because remember the, the, the slashes are treated like, a, like folders. So you need to uh, define a authentication, failure, log name, a UID, a whatever, and UID. TTY is a, a, a slash, that's a folder, dev, that's another folder, and PTS, that's another folder. And the remaining part is going to be the, the name of the shell library. I created a shell, a shell code, uh, very basic to uh, obtain, to, uh, to recover the, the SUID bit, and that's the shell library. This is the exploit I made, this is the calculation side. I, I made to, to define the environment variables. These are, these are the, the specific sizes I needed to overwrite the module and the NI structure. The, the P and Y are, the, are both necessary to overwrite the NI structure. Uh, and yeah, the, the A is to full the, the heap. Uh, and finally, with all those calculations, program name 30,000 times, I created the POC. Here we have, let's see if I can run it. I have a test user, it cannot uh, run to authentication failure. And then I run, I, I didn't put anything and I was brought. It was good. <laughs> Thanks. Some extra things. What about all the binaries? I said at the beginning, this, w this is ellipse. This is not related to the binary itself. If your binary is using it, is using this function, this is log function, you, are, you have this vulnerability. For example, I also try with passwd. I obtained same mistake, segmentation for core dump. In this case, I cannot exploit the same way because I don't have the minus w option. The minus w option is what you need to perform the feng shui, but if you look into the, 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 in, into the past the uh, binary and find some way to perform some feng, shui, some feng shui techniques, you might be able to exploit it some way, and you also have the, the same uh, situation like the module uh, load. Uh, so what about other operating systems? Same thing. Same thing. Uh, I also try with uh, Fedora in in, in server edition, 
and I also obtained the, the, same, the same error. But you have to take into account that even in different, in different operating systems, the, the heap might change. So you need to perform all those calculations again. You need to try to uh, adapt the, 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 the faster or maybe, uh, well, you need to, uh, I guess, the best approach in those cases is to try to, uh, to, to use a faster technique, a faster strategy. Because in those cases that where the, the heap might change upon different executions, it's going to be easier for you to have one faster and try to find the correct layout. Uh, but it might take more, more time. Actually, that's what uh, Qualys said on the, on the report. They didn't publish an exploit, of course. They just published uh, the things more or less that I said, but they didn't include as many information I have as I have. And, and they also they, they only said that they made it with a faster strategy. They, it took, I don't know the, what they say, 9,000 9, attempts to, to reach the, 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 the right layout. They only brute force the layout inside the heap until they reach the correct layout. So to finish, a lot of people say this. Sometimes heap overflows are like aligning the stats. And yeah, I, I, that's how I felt when I was exploiting this because it took a lot of time to reach the proper, the exact, uh, and, and a lot of calculations to reach the exact, the exact thing I needed to reach what I needed. Uh, okay, where are the, the protection, the operating system protections? I don't want to say anything, but the ASLR was activated. There wasn't, there wasn't anything uh, to stop me from running. I was overwriting uh, our name and nothing stopped me here. Again, the ASLR is not going to be useful because I'm not overwriting anything inside the stack. Uh, uh, that, that's another technique, but I, in this case, I, I'm not overwriting or redirecting the flow inside the program. I, I'm just injecting a library. So ASLR, not useful. Uh, the, the operating systems, unlimited scenarios. Uh, uh, that's also something that it's important to note. You need to, maybe it's a, a faster technique, might be more effective in, in those scenarios because it might change. Even in this case, this exploit works for Fedora, basic Fedora installation but it might change in different uh, scenarios. For example, if you try to, to, to execute it, I don't know, from remote through SSH, that simple thing that you're running it from SSH, it's going to make different, uh, different paths uh, inside the, the sub-binary or any other binary that you are using. And that's going to change also the, the heap layout. You have to be aware of that things. So yeah, in those cases, maybe a fuzzing is a better approach. And yeah, that was it. Any question? <laughs> yeah. Pepe, thank you. Do we have any questions at this time for Pepe? Anybody? Nothing at this moment, but uh, people can uh, approach you during the course of the day. Yep, and again, all the information will be available at some stage. Now, we are uh, ahead of ourselves, but the next speaker isn't until 10.15, so break, we can start the break early, but please do return in time for the next uh, presentation at 10.15. Thank you.